and we're University of Illinois Extension and we're the flagship outreach effort of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. We offer evidence-based educational programs to the residents of Illinois in all 102 counties. And here's a picture of campus that we like to share. And I'll introduce myself. I'm your moderator, Susan Glassman. I am a nutrition and wellness educator for Illinois Extension. And I serve the counties um, of Bureau, LaSalle, Marshall, and Putnam counties. And then I'd like to introduce our presenter today, Diane Reinhold. And Diane is also a nutrition and wellness educator. She holds her master's of public health from St. Louis University and she has a certificate of university teaching. She also is a registered dietitian and she serves the counties of Joe Davies, Stevenson and Winnebago. So with that, I know we're all waiting to hear her presentation and I'm going to turn it over to you, Diane. All right, well, thank you so much, Susan. Um, for anyone that has questions, you know, feel free to go ahead um, and type your questions into the chat box. Um, Susan will be keeping an eye on those as well as continuing to admit people if they um, are joining us a little late. But, you know, please go ahead and type your questions into the chat box. And then Susan and I will answer the questions at the end of today's presentation. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn my camera off um, just so I'm not distracted by myself um, and also to help with bandwidth. Um, as we know, some of our rural communities have uh, some issues with uh, bandwidth and actually it's just any community depending upon what's going on. So um, one of the last items that are often harvested from our gardens in this part of the country and you know, Northern Illinois is winter squash. And that's generally because it's one of the, the last items that are actually planted. Winter squash require a long growing season, generally anywhere from 75 to 100 frost free days. Um, the seeds um, typically are planted in late May in Northern Illinois. Um, and we're gonna plant them in late May so that there's no danger of frost um, and that the soil is gonna be warm enough. Typically we want the soil to be at a temperature of 60 to um, 70 degrees. And again, as I mentioned, the winter squash seeds are really sensitive. So we wanna make sure that they're gonna germinate. Um, winter squash is a culinary favorite because it's so versatile. And not only are they versatile, but they can also be stored and used for months long after harvest. So in today's presentation, we'll primarily be focusing on winter squash. Um, however, we're also gonna briefly touch on storing our root vegetables and apples, as well as talking about the ideal storage conditions, specifically for squash, but also in general for all of our, our fruits and vegetables. Um, our goal is to help increase um, your knowledge of squash, um, winter vegetables, and how to be able to enjoy them year, um, for months after harvest. So um, fruit and vegetables. Um, fruit is usually anything sweet tasting. Um, anything sweet, a sweet tasting part of the plant. Um, and vegetables are more of a savory and less sweet part of the plant. Um, and then we have nuts and nuts are hard and oily and they are um, shelled in a, in a shell. And that's um, from a culinary standpoint. But then we have certain um, fruit slash vegetables that fall in between. And so squash is technically a fruit. However, from a culinary standpoint, it's considered a vegetable. The general rule is that any edible plant can be categorized um, as a fruit if it has seeds. But if the seeds, uh, but if it's seedless, then it's generally a vegetable, which if you really think about it, then I ask about, well, what about seedless watermelon? Because that's a fruit. Um, so as you can see with the um, botanical terminology or the 
culinary terminology, it can get quite confusing. But at the end of the day, we're just going to focus on the fact that squash is a vegetable, even though during um, today's presentation, I'll often refer to it as a fruit. So what is the difference between um, summer squash and winter squash? Squash generally fall into two categories. The primary difference within these two categories lie in the maturity at harvest and how long it takes to grow them. Both varieties are going to depend um, entirely on the length of time they spend on the vine. Typically, winter squash um, ends up spending up to 120 days on the vine, compared to summer squash only needing to spend 40 to 60 days. Also, summer squash are generally harvested while they're still immature, and winter squash, you don't want to harvest them until they are mature. Summer squash um, is harvested when they are immature and they have very thin skins and can only be stored for a relatively short period of time. Additionally, they grow on non-vining bushes. So when you think about your zucchini plant, um, a lot of people like to plant zucchini because you don't have to worry about all the vines that you do for maybe your buttercup, your butternut, your pumpkins. Winter squash um, grow on vines and they're harvested when they're mature. So they have a thicker rind that's going to make it possible for us to store them um, months um, in, after harvest without having to worry too much about them rotting. Summer squash, um, um, the difference between summer squash and winter squash often is the type of dishes that they're used in. Winter squash is ideal for baking and stuffing, whereas summer squash is better served sliced, chopped, sauteed, or just simply cooked down. Winter squash can be stored, as I mentioned, for several months without refrigeration, although there are certain conditions that we recommend for storing your um, squash so that you can extend the shelf life. While summer squash are need to be chilled, um, and they can stay in the refrigerator for one to two weeks after they've been purchased. Susan, I noticed we have some feedback. So when it comes time to harvest our squash, um, harvesting winter squash, you want to do it, as I mentioned, when it's mature. It's going to be firm, it's going to be brightly colored, and it's going to have a hard rind. If you harvest it before it's mature, it's not going to store well, and it's going to um, be susceptible to um, early spoilage. It's important to also note that dead vines do not necessarily indicate that squash are mature. If a vine dies prematurely due to disease or stress, the squash will be immature, and it will result in a low-quality product. Um, and again, as I mentioned, it's not going to store well. Squash are ready to harvest when the, the rind is really um, hard and it's resistant to a fingernail scratch. So sometimes you'll see people at the store trying to um, uh, scratch the um, scratch the rinds, um, indicating whether or not it's um, hardened. Additionally, um, you can harvest slightly immature squash and pumpkin, but then you have to be very intentional about making sure that they are harvested. When it comes time to harvest your squash, um, excuse me, you wanna make sure they're um, adequately cured. When it comes time to harvest your squash, you're gonna cut about two to four inches um, from the fruit um, on the vine, and that's gonna allow for what seems like a handle. However, it's not recommended that you carry freshly um, trimmed or cut fruit from um, this handle, from the vine stem, um, because if that stem breaks off, it's going to open up the fruit and make it susceptible to um, dirt and microorganisms that can speed up the spoilage process. Hybrid squash, you're gonna wanna remove the stem. Um, that's kind of one of the exceptions to the rule. The other thing that's important when it comes time to harvesting your squash, you're going to want to do it 
before our temperatures, our nighttime temperatures drop to a temperature of 40 degrees. Um, if it gets that low, then there's going to be um, cellular properties that are going to change within that squash or pumpkin, and that can then accelerate the um, deterioration and spoilage process. The other thing it's important to understand when you're harvesting your squash is not to harvest it when it's wet and to uh, make sure that it doesn't get wet after harvest. Um, you don't want it to get wet because moisture is one of the key factors in the growth of harmful microorganisms that contribute to food spoilage. When, um, if you're transporting your squash or pumpkins from the garden, let's say you have your gardens, you know, quite a ways from the house and you're bringing everything in, um, what is recommended is that you're going to have some type of temporary padding put down. You can use uh, grain straw, you can use carpet, you can use um, some type of uh, foam rubber to transport it so that it's not damaged during that transportation process. It's also important that you're not stacking um, your squash or pumpkins. If you squash them, if you stack them, it's going to cause additional pressure um, and that can then cause to um, cause the, the squash to become dented. Um, and if you do have to um, stack them, make sure that you do not stack them more than um, three fruit high. So whether that's, you know, pumpkins or um, butternut or buttercup, squash, just make sure that whatever variety you have, you don't stack it more than three high. Food spoils, um, as soon as it, the food begins to break down and spoil as soon as it's been harvested. Um, and so we want to control that climate and the environment to prevent food spoilage. We want to be able to extend the shelf life of whatever it is that we are um, harvesting and, and preserving. And there are a number of factors that play into food spoilage. So time, temperature, light exposure, air, moisture, enzymes, and microorganisms all play a part in how long our food is going to store or uh, stay when we are storing it long term for the winter months. And our goal is to um, know what the environment that you are storing your food in so that you can make those adaptations and control it so you can extend the life of your produce. Having a, an ideal storage temperature when storing your harvest is critical to extending that shelf life because temperature impacts many different factors during the storage process. A real good general rule of thumb is that the storage temperature should be between 50 and 55 degrees. However, the exact temperature will depend on the type of produce that you are actually storing. Storing produce at a temperature of 50 to 55 degrees is going to help control the respiration rates. And by decreasing the respiration process, essentially we're going to um, decrease the rate at which food um, spoils. If our temperatures are too high, meaning that it's too warm, that's going to cause the flesh of your squash to become stringy and it will um, speed up the deterioration process. If it's too cold, then we have another issue because again, um, those low, if it's too cold below that 50 degrees, it can cause the chemical processes within the cells of your squash to change and that can result in a, a shorter shelf life. So our ultimate goal is to control the climate. We want to prolong the storage life by slowing respiration and protecting against food spoilage. One important factor to understand when storing your produce is the respiration process that occurs while food is in storage. Harvested squash and pumpkins are still very much alive, even though they are mature and have been removed from the vine. The respiration rate of fruit is most effectively controlled by lowering that temperature. And for each 18 degrees Fahrenheit 
that we reduce the temperature, the respiration rate is decreased by approximately one half. Um, and so that's why we recommend that lower temperature, that 50 to 55 degrees. And when we chill that, um, if we chill um, certain items too quickly, um, that can cause chilling injuries. And if chilling injuries occur because we've chilled it too quickly, um, then that's a whole nother set of issues that can we'll have to deal with. So respiration is a chemical process by which fruits and vegetables convert sugars and oxygen into carbon dioxide, water, and heat. So again, this is some really cool science stuff that most of us don't really think about. We just kind of like, you know, bring our pumpkins in, bring our apples in, you know, bring our potatoes in and, you know, put them in our storage. And then we don't really think too much of it. But then later when we go to get them, we might be thinking, okay, wait, now, why did these apples shrivel up? They shouldn't have shriveled like this. Or, okay, there was a blemish on this squash and, you know, now it's um, spread. It's, you know, the whole squash is um, contaminated and it's, you know, spreading to another squash. Um, so as I was saying, you know, the respiration process um, is very important to understand. And when we're storing our squash at those low temperatures, temperatures, respirations reduced, um, and that then impacts the rate of deterioration that occurs due to aging, thus extending our um, storage life. So what are these factors? I've already mentioned them a couple times, um, but we'll break down each of them really briefly. So even um, the first one we're going to talk about is relative humidity, essentially air moisture. And even though it has a little effect on respiration, a relatively high level is going to be needed to protect your produce um, against shriveling. So you really don't want to store your um, produce in a really, really dry area. You're going to want it typically between 70 and 75%. Um, if it's greater than 80, 85% or greater, it can enhance um, the development of disease because that moisture content's getting high enough where those harmful microorganisms are like, hey, we like this extra moisture, let's have a party and multiply and get out of control and you know, consume the squash. Um, another important factor is air circulation. It's important that we have um, good airflow um, when we're storing our produce. And this is important because it's going to help ensure that the temperature and relative humidity is going to be evenly distributed. Um, perhaps you haven't heard of it before, but our microwaves have hot and cold spots. Our refrigerators, our freezers have hot and cold spots. So even our basements or um, our storage areas where we're storing our produce, they're going to have hot and cold spots. And therefore, making sure that we have really good air circulation is going to help evenly distribute that temperature, even distribute, evenly distribute the humidity, and it's going to help prevent the formation um, of moisture that could occur from the fruit coming into contact with a, a surface area. Um, so if you think about if you were to um, put a squash um, in your garage. And so that squash, remember we said that it's, you know, um, it has respiration going on. So it's generating moisture, it's generating heat. Um, and again, we don't really think about it, but it's still occurring. And so if you have that going on and you put it in the, the basement or the concrete floor of your garage, then you can have condensation that builds up because of um, that process going on. And so having that good airflow is going to help um, kind of combat that. All right, so now we're gonna talk about moisture um, on fruit. And again, that moisture is gonna occur due to respiration. And we may not see it, we may not notice it. It's not gonna all of a sudden like um, be um, super sweaty. Typically you're not, I think of like how toilets sometimes sweat in the winter or in the summer months, um, depending upon your air conditioning status or how cold the water is. You know, we're not going to see a ton of condensation building up on our produce that's being stored, but it's going to be there. And so again, we want to um, prevent that from occurring. 
<clears throat> to decrease the risk of spoilage. Another thing we have to be aware of is ethylene gas. <clears throat> Ethylene gas is released by some fruits and vegetables during the ripening process, um, and it can promote the growth of microorganisms. <clears throat> and it can also contribute to food drying out and shriveling. So again, having good airflow is going to help that ethylene gas be dispersed um, and not be held and impact that particular produce item um, significantly. So if squash is next to um, a fruit or vegetable that's producing a lot of ethylene gas, it can cause the squash to kind of have that yellow hue to it. It can kind of turn a little yellow, yellowish. Um, and so to prevent that, um, you're going to want to make sure that your pro produce is spaced far apart. Um, that there's enough air, room for that air to circulate, um, and then also um, um, <clears throat> have, have that space there to extend the shelf life. So how, how can we help alleviate some of these issues with, you know, the temperature, the thickness of the rind? Well, one of the ways that we can do that is by curing. Curing squash is a great way to extend its shelf life. All squash undergo a slow curing process during storage, um, during their storage, if it's being stored properly. And so artificially curing isn't necessary for all squash um, because a mature squash that is stored in good conditions is going to already essentially be cured. However, curing does help toughen the skin up of, mature, of immature fruit um, and even our mature fruit, and it helps to heal any cuts and scratches. And when we're talking about curing, I want you to think back to those factors that I had mentioned earlier um, about controlling the climate, the time, temperature, light, moisture, air, and enzyme and microorganisms, because all of those are going to play a role in how long food's going to last. So when you're curing your squash, these items are all going to be essentially at play. When you're curing um, squash and pumpkins, you're going to cure them for 10 days. That's our time. We're going to make sure the temperature is between 80 and 85 degrees with a relative humidity between 80 and 85 percent. And you want to make sure that there's good airflow. So a lot of times people will put fans out um, in the area that they're um, curing their squash. Some people will use small cabinets and they'll have maybe a heater in there with a, a fan to help the air circulate and they have a thermometer making sure it doesn't get too hot. Um, but sometimes people will just corner off a section of a shed or a garage, put up some plastic and then get a thermometer out there um, that can assess the humidity level and temperature um, so that that can um, can um, cure very nicely. So as I mentioned during the respiration process, you know, our fruit continues to breathe, but as the skin hardens during the curing process, the rate of respiration, thus the rate of spoilage is gonna actually slow down. The harder the skin, the longer your squash should be able to be kept in storage. Of course, this is theoretical because there could be little you know, factors that come into play, but you know, that's the general concept. So think of the hardening of the, the hardened skin of your squash as a protective uh, layer or a protective arm, armor. And it's gonna help the squash to be um, impervious to mold and other harmful bacteria. Curing also helps to um, concentrate the natural sugars in the squash, making them sweeter and have a richer flavor. It also helps prevent the moisture loss during storage that occurs due to um, the respiration. And ultimately it's gonna help reduce the chance of spoilage or rot from occurring. Now, nearly all squash will benefit from curing, but there's one exception. Of course, there's always gotta be an exception, right? Um, and it's our little acorn squash. Acorn squash is an exception to the curing rule and that's because 
it actually is going to decline if it's left out in the sun. So it can be kept um, without cure, curing um, in an ideal pantry condition for anywhere from one to two months. Um, I read different numbers in different locations. And so I would say safely four to six weeks. It kind of sounds like that, you know, um, two month mark might be actually pushing the envelope. Um, so, you know, when you're curing or when you're storing your acorn squash, you're going to want to store it at a temperature of about 55 degrees. Um, and again, it's going to last anywhere from four to six weeks. Um, other types of squash that you're going to want to cure, buttercup, butternut, blue hovered, pumpkins, spaghetti squash. Again, almost all squash are going to benefit from um, um, being cured. One of the other questions I commonly get is, okay, so do I need to wash my squash? Well, um, again, here I read different, um, different recommendations from different um, agencies. And so, you know, washing generally is not needed, but you're going to want to make sure that you wipe it down, remove, remove any dirt um, or debris. Um, so up in North Dakota, our growing season is quite different than here in Northern Illinois. And so sometimes when we cover our harvest our squash, um, maybe there would be um, a lot of mud involved. So we would get as much mud off as possible. Um, and you're gonna wanna get that mud and um, any loose dirt removed. Um, and then one thing I'd recommend is that you go ahead and wipe it down um, with a damp cloth um, using a chlorine bleach solution. It's a really mild chlorine bleach solution. And remember, more isn't better because you don't want to accidentally poison yourself with bleach. Um, so you're going to use two tablespoons to one gallon of water um, and wipe it down because if there are any little cracks or cuts, um, that's going to provide an entrance for bacteria. Um, and then you're going to want to make sure that you thoroughly dry it. You're going to want to wipe it down and remove the dirt before you actually cure it. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you're going to want to make sure that when you're storing it, that you're not storing it on a cool concrete floor. Um, you're going to want to store it where there's not going to be a lot of uh, temper, uh, temperature differentials, where there's not going to be fluctuations. Also, as a reminder, don't stack um, and then do not store your squash near other ripening fruit. And that's because of the um, ethylene gas that's being um, uh, emitted. Also discard any signs of products that have decay um, or mark those to use them first because you don't want it to spread. And I, I really like the picture here because here you can tell this person is very intentional about how they're storing um, their products. Now we're going to talk briefly about storing some common root vegetables. Uh, several vegetables can be success successfully stored for several months when crops are properly harvested, cured, and dried, and then stored. And the temperature and humidity requirements for the storage of several commonly grown vegetables um, are going to be dependent upon what the product actually is. So you can see this could be kind of a conundrum because beets and carrots are stored at a much lower temperature than onions or even our squash. So um, after carrots and beets have been harvested, you're gonna wanna trim, trim away any uh, foliage to one half to one inch from the root. Um, and remember the root would be the orange part for your carrot and the top would be the green. And you can store carrots and beets at a temperature of 32 degrees um, with a relative humidity of 98 to 100%. And beets and carrots can be stored for several months if they're stored properly. Um, I was dig digging a little deeper because I always think, oh no, people want to know more details. And so carrots can be stored anywhere from four to six months, whereas beets can be stored anywhere from one to three months. But really, if you're going to store them for a longer period of time, there's many more steps that you need to take 
um, in order to ensure that they are going to be able to last that long. When it comes to onions, um, you should cure your onions after harvesting by spreading them on a single layer on a screen and put them in a shade, uh, a shaded area in a well-ventilated area such as a garage or shed and let them be out there for one to two weeks until the tops completely dry, um, dry and are shriveled. After the onions are properly cured, trim back the tops um, so that you only have about an inch um, of the onion um, on the, an inch of the green part that shriveled up. Um, and then go ahead and store your onions in a cool, moderately dry location. So when we say moderately dry, we're talking a relative humidity of 65 to 70% compared to a relative um, carrots, which have a much higher uh, moisture relative humidity. Now, if onions are stored properly, they can last 10 to 12 months. Next, we're gonna move on to um, potatoes. So potatoes um, should be cured at a temperature of 50 to 60 degrees at a, and a relative humidity of 85 to 90 degrees. And that curing process will take about two weeks. This is gonna allow, again, those minor cuts and bruises to heal. It's gonna allow the skins to become a little bit thicker. And once the potatoes have been cured, you can go ahead and store them in a cool, um, dark location. So when we say cool for potatoes, we're talking a temperature, and this is for red and russet potatoes, a, relative, or a temperature of 40 degrees with a relative humidity of 90 to 95%. And when stored this way, they can last six to eight months. Sweet potatoes, on the other hand, silly me, I kind of thought, well, they should be you know, pretty similar. However, unfortunately, they're not. So when you're curing your sweet potatoes, you um, it only takes 10 days to cure them. Um, and you're gonna um, store them or cure them at a temperature between 85 or 80 and 85 degrees with a relative humidity of 85 to 90. And it's gonna, again, you know, toughen up the skins and, and help things progress. Then after they've been cured, you're gonna store them at a temperature of 50 to 55 to 60 degrees with a relative humidity of 85 to 90 degrees. And they'll store for about four to six months. All right, apples. Apples, um, the length of time that apples can be stored depends on a lot of different things. So essentially, this could be a program in and of itself, storing apples, because as I mentioned, it's going to depend on the variety. It's going to depend on the maturity and the soundness of the apple at harvest, as well as the storage um, temperature. Late maturing apples are best suited for storage. Storage. Late maturing varieties are going to be uh, apples such as the Melrose, John Golds, and Spartans, um, and those are going to be best for home storage. When you're looking at long-term storage for apples, the temperature should be um, as close to 32 as possible. So if you aim between 30 and 32 degrees, that would be ideal. Apples are likely to suffer freeze damage if the temperature drops below 30 degrees. Um, and, um, and if they're stored in a warm temperature, meaning if the temperature were to get um, at 40 degrees or above, that will um, speed up the ripening process and call, cause them to deteriorate much more quickly. You're also gonna wanna make sure you pay close attention to the humidity level in the area that you're storing your apples. They desire a relative humidity of 90%. Um, and um, <clears throat> when you're storing your apples, you are going to uh, want to put them in boxes that have been lined with perforated food grade plastic um, or foil. And that is so that it can help prevent shriveling um, of the apples. And that's applicable for all varieties of apples. Um, and it's also important to note, you're not gonna want to seal or tie the bags or liners because if you seal them, that's going to cause the ethylene gas to um, you know, become too much. And we want to make sure that we have good airflow to um, disperse that gas so it's not gonna speed up the ripening process. 
Another thing I want to point out is that it's going to be important that you sort your apples, uh, you know, when you're sorting them, avoid bruising or damaging, damaging the apples. But when you sort your apples, your smaller apples are going to ripen much more quickly than your larger ones. So you're going to want to sort them by size. You don't want to have mixed apples where you have large apples causing smaller apples to ripen more quickly and then spoil. So again, you can see there's why this could be an entire hour long program, storing apples. Um, and then of course, as I've mentioned, the ethylene gas. And so <clears throat> ironically, apples produce um, a large amount of ethylene gas compared to other um, fruits and vegetables. However, apples are very sensitive to ethylene gas. So it's gonna be important, again, that you have really good airflow and that you're storing these apples away from um, other uh, produce that are gonna be impacted by the ethylene gas. So as a rule of thumb, again, it depends what variety and what the story conditions and what the harvesting conditions are. But theoretically, apples could be stored at home for three to five months in ideal growing conditions. So here is a really simple, um, easy guide. Um, and this is again, specific to um, pumpkins and squash. And you'll receive that um, in the handout um, that you receive after doing our evaluation. So um, I know we're right at time. I hope oh, we went over, I'm sorry. <laughs> but one thing I wanna ask is, um, you know, or let you know is that we have uh, di a program coming up October 20th and November 10th, and it's about preventing diabetes, um, enjoying the healthy side of life. So, you know, mark your calendars and watch for this information coming out. And with that, um, Susan, if you wanna go ahead and put the um, evaluation in the chat box and those that have to sign off, you're welcome to sign off. For those that wanna stay on, we'll go ahead and take questions. Thanks, Diane, and thank you for sharing all of this great information with us. I did add the link to our survey in the chat box. And after you complete your survey, there is a handout um, for you. And we really are looking forward to everyone joining us for our Preventing Diabetes um, webinars that are coming up on October 20th and November 10th. So please join us. We've had a few questions. So for those of you that are staying with us, um, Diane, one question was, can we buy squash or pumpkins at a, if we buy squash or pumpkins at a farmer's market or farm stand, should we assume that the fruit has been properly cured? Okay, so I would not um, make that assumption by any means. A lot of times when um, produce is being harvested um, to be sold at a farmer's market, it, it, it may be, you know, picked the morning of the day before. So I would definitely not make that assumption. I would ask the vendor, the farmer that you're buying your product from. Um, but then I would just plan, you know, if they're going to know it, whether or not when it was harvested, and then you'll just have to take steps accordingly. Okay, thank you. And with talking about um, wiping the squash with a bleach solution, is it also okay to use vinegar? There were a few questions in the chat box about that. Well, the um, information that I read specifically said um, bleach. Um, and so um, I know bleach is going to destroy harmful microorganisms. I don't necessarily know if vinegar would actually um, be able to do the same thing. Okay, thank you. And then um, when talking about storage and the humidity and temperature, should you have separate storage rooms to account for the difference in temp and humidity? You know, um, looking at the guidelines and recommendations, I would say yes, you should, because otherwise, you know, if it's too cold, that's going to impact certain food items that you're storing um, if it's too warm. So, you know, looking at that information, it does appear as though you should have different storage areas um, where you can then, you know, um, finagle or, you know, uh, manipulate the environment. 
Um, however, I'll say growing up, my we just we had either the garage or a storage area in our basement, um, and we just dealt with the fact that if certain things spoiled sooner or or whatnot. So, um, technically, yes, um, but individually, it's up to each individual. Okay, thank you. And back to the bleach solution. Did you say that you wipe the squash with the solution or dip it into the solution? So you are going to want to, um, you know, wipe it off, get any um, dirt, debris, dust off, and then you're going to take a damp cloth. And then you are going to go ahead and, um, you know, wipe it with that damp cloth. Then you're going to want to make sure that it is nice and dry um, because you don't want to add any additional moisture. So make sure that it's dry before you um, put it away. Okay, thank you. Now, and as you're wiping your squash, you'll yeah. notice that your, your bleach solution, your, your cloth, it's going to become dirty. And so you're going to need to, you know, change that frequently. Okay. Any information that you could share on storing garlic heads? How long should they dry before storing? You know, that is a great question. And unfortunately, I did not research um, the storage of garlic for this presentation. But if you leave your email, uh, I can send you an email um, or you can email me um, and I will follow up with you. Okay. So if you'd like to add your email, please do. And we'll, we'll look at that. We'll look that up for everybody. And then um, can pumpkins be cooked as soon as they are picked? I would think they would be able to. I don't, yeah. I don't know why you wouldn't, there wouldn't be any food safety issue that I would be aware of. Yeah, I'm going to say yes as well, because I think they're, they're able to be used immediately. So I wouldn't worry about curing them or anything before you use them. Um, and then someone mentioned with garlic, um, they store garlic hanging it in the garage in bunches, and it can last for almost up to a year. So if you want to add your email in, we can look that up and find it for you with the, the research that we use um, and send you all of that information. So but thank you for adding that. Uh, and let's see. I think that covers questions. I'm just looking through. Did anyone else have a question? OK. Oh, here we go. Um, Oh, could you show the slide with the squash storage? There we go. And I just want to point out, it says banana, but just it's banana squash. I'm sure people know that, but I was like, hmm, banana squash. <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, thank you to everyone for attending. And once again, I will add this link for the survey. Um, just in case you missed it throughout the chat here. But thank you so much for attending and thank you, Diane, for the presentation. You are very welcome. Have a great week. Thank you for joining us for this series. Um, it's been really fun. I hope um, that, you know, for those that have been able to attend all of them, um, that, you know, they've really gotten a lot out of it. And for those that haven't been able to attend all of them, you know, in our um, follow-up email, our thank you email um, that I'll be sending out later today, there's gonna be a link where you can go and look at previously recorded uh, webinars, um, whether it's our fill your pantry webinar um, that we did last summer with a lot of uh, home food preservation information, or this year's, you know, um, eat local, eat fresh, kind of your guide to navigating farmers markets, um, doing some basic food preservation. You know, we've covered the gamut. So please check out those resources and please join us in um, October for our um, diabetes program. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Mm -hmm.
Hello, and welcome to the Mindfulness in Ag project. My name is Chelsea Byers, and I'm an Extension educator with University of Illinois Extension. Research has shown that practicing mindfulness reduces your stress, it helps us with concentration, and it can improve your night's sleep. It also can help us with controlling our emotions. Before we start today's practice, though, let's check in with how you're feeling. Let's take a deep breath in and blow it out. Today's practice is on gratitude. Gratitude is being grateful for the things that we have in life. Do you have a daily practice of gratitude? If not, you might want to start incorporating it into life. Gratitude is something that you can do anywhere. You can practice the daily habit of gratitude first thing in the morning when you get up. You can do it during the day while you're doing your chores, riding your tractor, or right before you go to bed. Incorporating gratitude in your life can be something you can do with your family at mealtime. Maybe it's not something you do every day, but you could do it maybe once a week. The practice of gratitude though on a daily basis does have good benefits for both your brain and your overall body. It does help us give us thoughts of positivity and it can combat the stress that we have in life. When you think about being grateful, try to think about at least three things that you're grateful for. When you incorporate this practice of gratitude in your life, it can show you the positive. Again, try incorporating more gratitude in your life. You can just say it to yourself, or you can say it and share it with others. Some people even have a gratitude journal where they write down what they're grateful for on a daily basis. Today's practice is on gratitude. So what are you grateful for today? I'm thankful that you're investing in your health. Remember that these practices are good for both you as an individual and your families. I hope that you enjoyed our moment of mindfulness and you explore other mindfulness and ag videos. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to See You Wise TV. We hope you enjoyed the show. This video can be accessed anytime on YouTube.com. In the YouTube search bar, type in UPTV6 and look for their microphone logo. We hope you will join us again next week for more local, engaging content designed specifically for Champaign County older adults. Take care and stay safe.